talk about it. Now, the, uh, the album is BK3. Yes, it is. And uh, it's a little different than the other ones. It's, it's, uh, y- y- there's more vocals. There's m- it's, more, uh, it's, it's more of a, um, well, it's a more rock album. It's not so much an intra- instrumental kind of thing. Right. Yeah, th- th- in fact, the instrumental, which I'm very proud of, that was almost an afterthought on this record. Well, the goal with uh, Jeremy Rubolino, you know, Jeremy and I, was to, to make a great record, and uh, absolutely no compromise. So it, it really meant that some of the songs we started with, we actually didn't finish, because once we got Gene involved and his son Nick, you know, the formula kind of changed. So there was this constant, you know, evolution of the record, you know, that with the ultimate goal of making a really strong album, and every song had to be a strong song and fit you know, this combination of, of you know, a, a record should have a little beginning, middle, and end, you know, and I, I feel like the sequencing, and even though this featured guys, you know, and, and the music changes a bit, it it uh, it has a, th- there's a really pleasant cohesiveness about it. Oh, absolutely. I'm, r- I'm really happy with it. Now, before I ask you about the vocalists on this, uh, in the past, did you feel sort of a pressure just because you are the guitarist, you know, that you were in Meatloaf and in Kiss and in Grand Funk, that you had to make instrumentals, like people expected sort of a Steve Vai thing out of you? Is that Was that part of it, or did you just want to do that? I think the first two records, some of them I felt like, hey, I can make this a real guitar thematic thing. It wasn't about okay. trying to be Vai or Satriani, even though I would describe sometimes the song as Satriani meets, meets Kiss. You right. know? Um, a, a lot of that was done just out of the kind of just single-minded approach to my music. And once Jeremy committed to, to working with me, and, and his goal was to, uh, you know, push me and push me, it was about songs then. It wasn't about, everybody knows I can play guitar, and right. I'm still going to have a featured solo, so why does, you know, you don't really need four instrumentals on your record, do you, you know? Right. Well, if you're going to do one, <coughs> which is the one that I did write, then even then we took it to the next level. Like, if he would have said to me when I first wrote it, yeah, in this song you're going to have Steve Lukather on it too, I would have said, like, you know, you're out of your mind, you know. That all happened very ironically, too, but, um, you know, the goal, again, was just strong songs and not so much about um, how many instrumentals should we have, you know. Absolutely, and I was going to ask you about the Steve song in a minute, but let's get to it right now. Um, was it fun to sort of have that dual thing going on, sort of dueling guitars, or? Yeah, we didn't know how it would all like, kind of work out in the end because the at, out of respect to Steve, mm-hmm. you know, asking him to come in and, and, and just jam on the track. Um, we never really had a master plan. Okay, these are your spots. We just had them like, I already knew I had the chorus themes, and I knew there'd be other spots I'd play in, but I didn't really have it all um, kind of mapped out. Jeremy and I were really flying blind, but we knew we weren't in trouble when we'd have a guy like Steve Lucas playing. I mean, the guy can, you know, probably, you know, play guitar while he's, you know, doing the dishes if he wanted to. Yeah, absolutely. You know I mean? the, guy, the guy just is... Uh, just incredible on the guitar, and, um, you know, so we just brought him in to jam on things, we left the chorus things we had, and we pieced together what what really worked, and then I finished up the gaps, you know, it was done in a very unorthodox way, but you'd never know it, it does seem like as if we're in the studio together du- dueling, and I've even performed it, um, you know, without my, you know, guitar parts live that I that I perform, you know, in person. So you hear Steve's parts, and then I'm answering him. And even that works, you know, even though it's very unusual how it's all, uh, how we communicate on the song. So a good song's a good song. It doesn't matter how it comes together or what master plan behind it, you know, as long as it it, it feels good. Absolutely. Speaking of unusual, let's look at the vocalists on this. They're they're all over the place, which is great. Mm -hmm. You've got, let's start with the the Mac, Mm -hmm. Doug Feger. Right. Because it's sort of a knack sound, sort of that early yeah. 80s sound. How, d- how did he come about? Well, you know, I met Doug at the fantasy camp. He was also a counselor one year, probably about four years ago. And I, I was always a big fan of my Sharona and the knack, and he's such a big Beatle fan and power pop kind of group. Ah, that's a good and term for it. It's a power pop yeah, kind of song. Yeah, and then when Jeremy and I wrote that song, I, as soon as we were done with the vibe of it, I was like, uh, you know I'm not going to be able to sing this. <laughs> and... and you know, and we knew that. We didn't care when we were writing good material. It wasn't a point about, like, everything be tailored to my voice. We knew that the album should have some opportunities for some guest, uh, you know, singers. And, and, and Doug pretty much came to mind right away, you know. And once he heard the song, he was just like, I love it, you know. I'll do it, you know. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's so. a great song. And it's a great yeah. vocal, too. Great yeah, yeah, he did really well. And uh, there's just some backings from, from, from Jeremy and I. And, and, and it's very, very, it's very cool. It's, it's all great. You know, I'm re- really excited about that track. Now let's work our way up this ladder here. Next, we've got John Karabi. Of course, you've mm-hmm. worked with him many times before. You've toured with ESP and Union right. and all these other shows. Quickly, about John. Great vocals. Nice yeah, bluesy I feel to it. Yeah, I really feel like I got the best of John on uh, his song, um, you know, No Friend of Mine. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it, it was always a given that, that John and I could, could be really, uh, have that chemistry and be creative together. But for Jeremy, it was a real dream. One of his favorite records um, was The Blue Room. Right. So for Jeremy to, to have, have his hand in uh, working with John um, like that, uh, I, know, I know he really got off on that. And I really feel like that track... Uh, kind of really sums up, you know, the best of what John and I do, and it is kind of union-like, but I think it was taken to another level on, on BK3, so that's kind of why I started the EP with that song, I just felt really good about it. Yeah, it's, uh, you, you, like you said, you've got a great chemistry, and it hopefully you'll do some more stuff. Yeah, yeah, on. I mean, I wrote something for his new record, and I think he's going to finally finish it up uh, come the new year, so... Um, and it might be even nice to step outside a union and do like a, mm-hmm. a Kula Karabi kind of just project that's something I've, I've actually thought about you know so you're not you're not uh, you know surprising me with your you know suggestion there yeah but I think I, we'll I be appreciate good. that yeah and then so as we move up here now we've got Nick Simmons well, Gene's Nick, uh, son yeah I mean it was uh, I was brave enough of course uh, asking Gene to be involved but he kind of offered up Nick and right. I was already going to ask him if, if, if uh, Nick would, would you know how would he feel about Nick singing a song knowing that he had dabbled a little bit in music from right. the show and everything, and it just worked out way better than I ever expected. First of all, his lyrics are really amazing. Oh, he wrote the lyrics? Yes. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. The lyrics are totally from that kind of okay. uh, comic, not comic book, rather, but, but yeah, more sci-fi comic book, if right. you know what I mean. And, you know, he's more in the Lord of the Rings world than I am, if you know what I mean, mm-hmm. with the imagery, or, 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 you know, at least lyrically what I could come up with. I just thought he did a terrific job with that. We just when I typed out the lyrics for the uh, booklet, I was really blown away with, uh, you know, how how cool his imagery was. And um, yeah, he was a big part of making that song. I mean, Jeremy and I knew we had this killer track, and um, you know, we, we weren't sure what was going to happen vocally for it. And then suddenly Nick steps up to the plate, and he did. He well, that's did what great. I was going to ask you. Was 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 he a little scared coming into the studio, I mean, sort of recording his first official vocal? And of course, you going, <coughs> okay, Gene's son here now. If it's yeah. great, it's great. And if it's bad, do I tell Gene? Like, right. Like right. <laughs> yeah, he was in good hands with Jeremy and I. And what was interesting was he was certainly green, you know. Mm-hmm. And there were certain terms we'd throw at him that he didn't know that only, you know, people that work in the, the studios the studio done. know, right? So, and, and what was really cool is once we got a, a really good vocal out of him, um, we knew we needed to. Um, uh, you know, add some harmony or backgrounds to it. So we asked him to come in again, and by then he really lived with what he did, which we were, we were happy with it because mm-hmm. uh, we didn't really know what he was capable of. But he right. goes, I can sing this better, you know, you mind if I sing it again? And we were like, wow, you know, sure, you know, go for it. So actually the final vocal, the one that you have, is actually all the, the, the second time he sang it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, 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 and again, he kind of harmonized to that at, point, at points. But it, it just, I, I just found that the coolest thing was teaching him anything, like kind of, like the comment would come up, like, okay, let's do it one more time, and then we'll comp the vocals, you know, which, uh, you know, musicians right. know is just putting together the best parts. And he was like, comp? What's yeah, comp? Comp what? Right? <laughs> you know, comp? You know, it was very much like, like young uh, student Gene or something asking a question, <laughs> you know. So uh, it was really, really a lot of fun because he's just such a very, very likable, smart, and, and fun guy who, I think he gets it, you know, he could be such a monster if you think about it, being mm-hmm. the son of someone as famous and wealthy and successful as Gene, but he's not, he's got it, so I'm just always like blown away with his personality and everything, How what a, what a very, very um, down to earth. fun, down-to-earth, cool guy, he even made the effort to come see Grant Funk when we were playing not far from his uh, college. And Before the recording, just to sort of get a feel for it, or? Uh, no, no, no. I think that was actually after he okay. already recorded the track, and and even if it was in between, it didn't matter. He's a fan of music, and right. and and he was just raving to his dad about Grand Funk because Gene hadn't had a chance to see it. As Paul has, and of course.